speak. No thanks at all. <laughs> thank you everyone for coming here this morning and, and partaking. And thank you also to those of you who have resisted the temptation to get back into bed with that second cup of coffee this morning, um, but rather have sat yourselves down in front of the computer. Um, when, when Eustace asked me to speak, I'm afraid I didn't listen properly and failed to notice that he asked me to speak only on the neoadjuvant and adjuvant aspects of, breast, of, of HER2 treatment. Um, so you've got the whole, the whole gamut. Um, um, but I think that's probably fair enough because um, what we do in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting is often informed by what we first see in advanced breast cancer. Um, I'm not too sure who is all out there, um, so forgive me, um, I've tried to do a talk that, that will apply to everyone, which of course ensures that this talk um, um, pleases nobody, um, but, <laughs> but um, you know, if you've been around like me since almost the dawn of pre-time, I'm very sorry if you know most of this, of the development of um, the initial development of anti hert treatment. And if you're in the earlier start of your career and perhaps you're in the state and thinking, when will this ever apply to me? I could just reassure you that when I was in that position, I never thought that any of this would come to pass. So, so hang in there. Okay, let's see if I can get this going. Okay, so this was a slide that I dragged out of a presentation that I gave over 12 years ago. And I'm happy to say it's as relevant now as it was then, because there are all sorts of things that are coming up now. Um, and um, added to that slide there, we can see trastuzumab, margituximab, the two um, pure uh, um, um, antibodies, and then together with those that, that um, um, you could see lipatinib, fatinib, neratinib, and to that must be added to catinib. We'll talk a little bit about those that inhibit the, um, the PI3 kinase pathway. And then, of course, we've got those wonderful drugs that deliver a payload of chemotherapy, as Nerd talked to us about and the TDM1 and trastuzumab deruxtecan, plus, of course, there's some even new things over there. And yes, I mustn't forget um, pertuzumab, um, also um, a HER2 antibody binding to a slightly different area. So we all know this, and, and um, Nero has given us a slide like this. I find it actually amazing, and thank God that this stuff actually was identified right in the beginning. I love to tell my patients that, that, that um, the development of trastuzumab is... is quite unusual in the treatment of any kind of disease, because as most of us know, much of what we do in medicine is based on fortuitous finds. We invent a drug for something else and find out what it really is good at, and then it becomes used in that context. So for example, Viagra was invented for angina, um, and none of the gentlemen wanted to give their tablets back at the end of treatment, and then they found out what it was good for. And I mean, closer to home, tamoxifen was invented as an ovarian cycle regulator for those ladies who wanted to become pregnant. Um, and God knows which lady was in that position noticed that her breast cancer lump disappeared with treatment with tamoxifen, but then we found out what it was good for. But, but the development of, of trastuzumab was not like that. And it was an actual act of faith where Dennis Lehman and other investigators went out to look for what it was that was driving aggressive breast cancer cells, identified this um, particular receptor, and then created a blocker for that receptor and proved that it worked. And not only was that amazing, um, amazing in itself enough, but if you look at the very early studies of trastuzumab administration as a single agent, um, in heavily pre-treated uh, pre -treated patients, it didn't have um, a particularly fantastic effect as a single agent. So it was only really later on when it started to become combined with adjuvant, uh, with chemotherapy that, that we saw the really good results. And so um, 1995, the phase three trial by Dennis Slayman led to um, um, FDA recommendation that it be used. And then also the European, a little bit later, phase three trial by Marty brought this stuff in. And as they say, the rest is history. Okay, so, so what are the wonderful things about, about trastuzumab? Well, it's relatively non-tox. Oh, dear. My slide didn't work out very well over here. <laughs> so the, the incidence of cardiotoxicity at five years here actually should, should look a little bit better and shouldn't start below zero. But, but it ranges. Um, um, in, those, in those trials that um, did not use anthracyclines, you've got a five-year toxicity, cardiac toxicity, um, well below 1%. And those that gave it in conjunction with an anthracycline, not more than 4%. And as you can see, the cardiac toxicity does not increase with time. And the benefits were sustained. So this is um, a, um, an a intention to treat analysis looking at um, the various adjuvant treatments. And you can see that um, 
uh, sustained over two, four, and five years are the benefits of adjuvant trastuzumab. And um, here, of course, was confounded by crossover. So if you take those over, you can see you can see higher up that um, it, it doesn't cross um, one. Um, and if you look at the bottom of that slide, you'll see that the benefits, the relative benefits of trastuzumab in these aggressive patients are very similar to the numbers that I give my patients for the benefits of five years of tamoxifen, a relative reduction of recurrence of 50% and mortality, overall mortality of up to 30%, as Noah alluded to. This is amazing. I mean, this is fantastic stuff. Yeah, you can see that um, in, in slightly more numerous terms, and you can see there the absolute benefits um, highlighted in blue of the various clinical trials. Okay, don't worry about this slide. This is what Noah was talking about earlier, the um, NCC and guidelines. This is really important. And the only point I'd like you to see, if you can see that, my God, is the third <laughs> bullet point. Uh, and if I screw up my eyes, that what that's talking about is if you are at all worried that you are not getting a HER2 positive result, if it's looking a bit ishy, wishy-washy, and you think, Mike, perhaps, perhaps this patient would benefit from, from an anti-HER2 agent, don't hesitate to ask your pathologist to do it again and to you know, discuss with them, phone them up and say, did you select the most aggressive part of the tumor? Um, is there something else that you can do? Is there another part that you can go back and have a look at? Um, and sometimes we just accept you know, um, HER2 negative, two plus ish negative. Some, some of those patients, especially those borderline ones, if you find a different part, you can get a positive result and it's really worth it. Okay, um, as I think most of us know now, one of the wonderful things also about trastuzumab um, is that it, um, it, 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 you can use it in post-progression in the advanced breast cancer setting. And I think this is accepted by everybody except some of the medical aides who don't want to pay for it. This is a slide that comes from an observational study, um, which comes with all those caveats, but the, you know, it gives you such an enormous overall survival benefit that, that most of us um, can't argue with that. And so we know now just to change the cytotoxic um, doublet together with your anti-HER2 treatment if you don't have access to new anti-HER treatments. But if the, 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 um, the cell retains its, its dependence on the HER2 positive um, pathway, even in the case of progression. What about older patients? Um, and this is that um, um, trial done um, some time ago looking at patients who were elderly and ER positive. Um, do they benefit from the addition of Herceptin? And you may remember in the old days, if um, such patients were give, given adjuvantly only an aromatase inhibitor, well, um, the, this ta the tandem trial here looked at the addition of trastuzumab to an aromatase inhibitor in elderly ER positive patients. And there was um, an, a benefit in the objective response rate and overall response rate. This did not translate into an overall survival benefit. And I'm actually gonna talk to you quite a bit more about that um, in some forthcoming slides later on. Um, so, so let's look at that a little bit more closely. And this, this, this was published, I think, last year um, or um, in the um, JCO. And this was looking at exactly the same sort of um, um, bunch of patients, um, elderly ER positive, um, who were also HER2 positive. Should you give those ladies in the adjuvant setting just um, an anti-estrogen and trastuzumab, or will they actually benefit from the addition of cytotoxic chemotherapy? Because we know that this really stimulates um, the activity of Herceptin or any of the trastuzumabs you might wish to use. And, and this actually did show a statistically significant benefit in our older patients for giving cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, and there was an overall survival benefit that was statistically significant. So I think we have to be quite, quite careful about withholding cytotoxic chemotherapy in our HER2 positive patients, even if they are ER positive. However, if you look at what that benefit actually panned out to be, um, there was a survival benefit difference, overall survival benefit difference of three months only. So I think there are definitely a group of patients, an older group of patients whom we can give adjuvant um, aromatase inhibitors to together with trastuzumab alone and leave it off, accepting that um, there's going to be a small, uh, statistically significant, but possibly clinically irrelevant survival um, drop off. Okay, can we do better? Um, so this, this of course, 
can be divided neatly into two categories. Can we better treat those patients who are at high risk of recurrence um, and death? And in those patients who are at low risk, can we downscale the amount of treatment that we can give, thereby decreasing toxicity, treatment burden, time spent in the chemo unit, cost, the whole lot we all know. Okay, so I'm going to start with the second one first, and I'm afraid many of the trials fall into the trap of um, statistical vagaries. Um, and this comes to um, some of the ones that looked at a very short duration of anti-HER2 treatment and those that looked at um, in between one and one year and six months. So just to contextualize and background, why on earth did we land up with one year in the first place? Well, that goes all the way back to the fact that when, you know, trastuzumab was first invented, nobody knew for how long it should be given in the first place. So they just based the data on the trials used with tamoxifen. And the first trial with tamoxifen looked at one year versus naught, and the second trial looked at two year versus one. So of course, HERA combined that and looked at naught one and two years thereby and showed that there was a, a huge benefit for the addition of trastuzumab, but the two years only gave you more toxicity and not a further benefit. And so on the basis of that, one year was arbitrarily accepted as the amount of time that we should treat patients for in the adjuvant setting. But it would be fabulous to give them less. Now, um, as, as those of us who've also been around for a long time, remember that for a long time, many medical aides leapt on board with the FinHer treatment, you know, that Finnish study looking at the addition of only nine weeks of trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting. Um, and then furthermore, some ones which were um, pre-specified, the shorter and the SOL the, the trial, um, Italian study, um, where they were looking at a short, very short duration of treatment. FinHer, out of interest, was never, ever, supposed to look at the benefits of trastuzumab. It was a trial that was done, designed to look at the difference between um, ataxane and venorobine and to see whether you could give venorobine rather than ataxane to these early breast cancer patients. Um, the entry criteria were modified when trastuzumab first became um, um, approved by the FDA to allow for the addition of trastuzumab in HER2 positive patients. So actually, if you look at those data, I think all of 46 patients were treated with trastuzumab and ataxane. And that was all that was used to base um, recommendations of nine weeks only on forgetting the statistical stuff. But for those that were actually designed to look at a shorter versus longer trial, I'm not a statistician and actually I uh, really struggle with these, but the st statisticians um, do assure me that it is far more difficult to prove a double negative. So in other words, we've got a benefit. We know that one year is a benefit. You now actually have to look at whether it is um, a shorter duration is non-inferior. And this is much more difficult to do. Um, so you will find that many of these actually didn't prove non-inferiority. Um, Persephone, the largest trial of all, um, with over 4,000 patients randomized to, to this trial, actually had 69% no negative. And um, uh, so, so these were people that were already at quite a low risk, and 53% of those were still being treated according to the HERA protocol, which the UK loved to do in those days, where we know that the active benefits of trastuzumab are actually decreased relative to if you give it concurrently with cytotoxic chemotherapy. So this actually, if you give an inferior um, way of giving a treatment to a, a lower risk group of people, you abrogate the, the, the benefit scene. So it's quite difficult to tease, tease this kind of stuff out. Um, there was a very good um, critique of all of these published um, in the ASCO, um, ASCO post a couple of years ago by a guy called Charles Vogel. I don't know if any of you have had the privilege of going to San Antonio um, in Texas, but if you have, you will remember that almost every publication is, is immediately questioned by an elderly dumpy gentleman who hobbles up to the, to the microphone and says, Vogel, New York. Um, but actually, he's, he, he's fabulous. And he's a very clever community oncologist. And he published a very good um, critique of these trials. And I urge you just to quickly have a look at it on the net if you want to. So, so what else can we do? Uh, rather than attenuate the length of trastuzumab um, administration these days, where um, either you can give it subcut and it's quick and easy for our patients, or you can give it intravenously cytotoxically. Um, and at far lower cost than we've previously had. What about downscaling um, our type of chemo, um, for example, leaving off the anthracycline as an APT trial? 
So I just want to um, quickly go through the, um, some of the data about that. The seven-year update was published, I think, in 2019 in the JCO. This was a single arm trial looking at low-risk patients. Um, theoretically low risk patients. Um, these, there were 405 of them and they were allowed into the trial if their tumor was less than 3.1 centimeters, so three centimeters and less, and if they were node negative or else you could have one micromate. Um, of course, this suffers from the same problem that many of our clinical trials um, that we use to decide on our chemotherapy, um, such as Responderex, et cetera, um, suffer from, and that is that there were very few of those patients with the larger tumors. And so only less than 10% had tumors in between 2 and 3%, reducing the value of prognostication for this trial in that group of patients. Two-thirds of them were hormone receptor positive. In other words, remembering that this data can still apply to hormone receptor negative patients. I sometimes forget that. The primary endpoint was disease-free survival, not, um, um, but you might argue in this low-risk group of patients that that, that is not the best um, endpoint to use, because um, if you have a look at it, um, at, at, at six years, at the seven-year update, um, there were eight deaths in total, um, only four of whom had recurred. So, so um, this is a very low risk population and, and whether disease free survival is the way to look at it or not, you can at least say that in this group of patients, specific, especially if they're two centimeters or less, you can get away without an anthracycline giving them um, trastuzumab. And this, they, yeah, they did give trastuzumab for an entire year, 12 weeks with paclitaxel and then nine months there afterwards um, in, the, in the adjuvant setting. Um, oh, yes, there was also a very good critique of, of which um, primary endpoint to use um, in the Annals of Oncology published in 2014, looking at all of this. I'm not going to go into it now. Okay, so what can we do about our higher risk patients? There's so much to say. I'm going to try and gallop through this, as I said, <laughs> but we're going to get on to pertuzumab first and the addition of pertuzumab. It, um, pertuzumab, you, all of you know this. Um, it is a, a dimerization inhibitor, um, whereas trastuzumab only prevents the dimerization of monomers. This does um, the, um, both her one and her four, um, as well as um, um, its, its, other, its other activities there. You can see it's stimulating also antibody drug conjugates, um, uh, the, the anti that your, your, your immune system in the same way as, as trastuzumab does. And of course, the big thing, the big change was, was when Jose Baselja stood up in San Antonio, Texas in 2012 and to rapturous um, standing ovation presented these initial data from the Cleopatra study, looking at the addition of trastuzumab to pertuzumab and um, taxotere, docetaxel in patients who had never previously been treated in the advanced breast cancer setting. And um, I must just um, remind all of you that a large portion of these patients were completely untreated in total, um, which is not the kind of patients that we see these days. Almost all of our patients now have been treated with trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting. Um, and there are very few ab initio patients. But here you can see after a very short time, not only did we have a statistically significant and clinic clinically meaningful progression-free survival benefit, but we also had a overall survival benefit. And um, Sandra Swain in the New England Journal of Medicine showed a further update. And here I've just given you the overall survival benefit um, of 16 months in 2015. And the end of um, the end of trial final update she did in the Lancet Oncology um, recently, um, 2020, um, giving you um, the, those data that have been sustained um, all the way out to six years. Good. Um, now, that's all very well for advanced breast cancer, but what about cure and can we bring this wonderful treatment into earlier stage disease? So, so now we're starting to talk about um, adjuvant and neoadjuvant trials. And of course, you, um, you may remember that um, there was a lot of excitement about whether um, complete pathological response seen in a tumor with neoadjuvant disease, um, a neoadjuvant treatment of disease predicted for overall adjuvant survival and progression-free survival benefit. And for, for quite a while, certainly the Americans were totally in love with doing new adjuvant treatment and using complete pathological response as an, inter, as an intermediate marker for, for um, long-term benefit. 
And this was first tried at, um, in the New Alto trial, and, and some of you might um, be remember being investigators on both New Alto and then, of course, the, 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 adjuvant, Alto, um, the adjuvant Alto trial, um, where lapagna was added to pepcitabine. Um, and the one that looked at pertuzumab was the Neosphere trial. Um, and um, um, this was once again Jose Basilda. He had a good year in 2012, um, which was published in, um, in the Lancet. And here you can see that the addition of um, the second anti HER2 agent does give you an increased um, um, pathological complete response in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, the new the Neosphere trial was an open label phase two clinical trial in chemo naive women, again um, with HER2 positive early breast cancer and tumors that were greater than two centimeters. And the way they did that to make sure that their benefit seen was um, only due to the addition of pertuzumab and nothing else was they gave these patients neoadjuvant four cycles of um, docetaxel combined with trastuzumab and either a placebo and pertuzumab. Then they went to surgery. Then they had adjuvant in those days, it was three, um, three cycles of FEC100, three weekly, and trastuzumab was continued for a year. So the only pertuzumab that the patients received was in the neoadjuvant setting. And then they landed up um, assessing them for, for their, uh, their, um, their pathological response at surgery. This is fantastic in the sense that you can truly highlight the difference then between your investigational agent and, 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 um, noth and nothing else. But what it doesn't take into account is what the benefit of your, your adjuvant treatment is going to be on your overall survival. And in fact, would have had, whether that would have had a, bit, a, a difference in terms of complete pathological response and whether that makes a difference because that's actually how we give new adjuvant treatment. We don't send patients to surgery halfway through or not. So, so you might say that none of this actually applies to us in clinical practice. Okay, so we know that it um, gives a better PCR in the neoadjuvant setting. Does this lead to better disease-free and overall survival? So um, we'll just look at the five-year update in terms of how those patients did, um, which was published some time ago in Lancet Oncology. And then we'll spend a bit of time looking at the adjuvant treatment, the adjuvant trial, the affinity trial, updated um, data of which was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology last year. So this slide doesn't distinguish between treatments, but does show you outcome um, over a period of time in those patients who achieved complete pathological response to non-PCR. And overall, you see in your near sphere, five-year progression-free survival for those patients who achieved complete pathological response was 85%. And for those patients who did not achieve complete pathological response was 75%. Now, if you want to nitpick about this, you might want to say, well, is this due to the addition of your treatment or is it due to um, your staging and volume of disease only? And that goes right back to that, that, that critique in 2014 that I mentioned that was published that said that actually the majority of this difference can be explained by volume of disease and not treatment. So, so do be careful um, in terms of how one interprets results in clinical trials. Even the devil can quote the Bible. Okay, so let's get on to the actual um, confirmatory adjuvant trial, the affinity trial, where patients here um, were um, and went surgery first. And if they um, um, if they were node positive or they had a tumor that was greater than a centimeter, they could be randomized to adjuvant treatment with or without pertuzumab and standard adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy at the, dis at the discretion of the investigator. For those who like giving anthracyclines, you could give an anthracycline. If, and if you didn't want to, you didn't have to, but you had to give something that had been validated in the past. Pri uh, primary endpoint was um, invasive disease, free survival, and the usual secondary endpoints, which included distance disease, free survival. Survival. And you will see now more and more that this is coming in, um, in um, next to overall survival as a, as a secondary endpoint, a pre-specified secondary endpoint. I think this is really important because certainly in places where these trials are done mostly in the first world, there is now access to so many anti 2 agents that, that you could say that um, it's becoming a chronic disease. And if you're waiting for your overall survival as an endpoint, you're going to wait a hell of a long time. Um, so um, they use as um, distant uh, recurrence-free um, survival as, as a, um, a, a, an intermediate marker of overall survival. 
And this indeed is something that we see here in the affinity trial. And you can see that there is a, a significantly significant, a statistically significant advantage in um, invasive de disease free survival at six years for patients where pertuzumab was added in an adjuvant setting. Um, but this, and although there was a trend, this doesn't yet um, translate into an, a, a statistically significant overall survival benefit. You can, of course, do exploratory um, subgroups. And here you can see in your lymph node positive, there was a benefit. But I caution you again, these are exploratory subgroups and they were not pre-specified in your clinical trial. And that means they are hypothesis generated, generating as opposed to um, confirmed. And if you look at the overall survival benefit curves, I mean, that looks as close as damn it to me as exactly the same. This just I'm not going to go into this slide, but this 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 is my slide that says that even the devil can quote the Bible, and this is how you should never ever report anything. This slide was shown to me online by a respected international investigator, um, giving you cross comparisons of trials that were designed to look at different things um, in order to motivate for um, extended treatment, and I just think it's terrible. Having said that, I'm sure there is a benefit in high-risk patients. Um, for us here, we have a problem because we um, only have access to pertuzumab intravenously. And so if you're going to add a pertuzumab in your adjuvant setting, um, you now have to bring your patient in to give it um, intravenously. Whereas in the first world country, the Frederica trial showed equivalence um, or non-inferiority um, between a combined subcut injection of pertuzumab and trastuzumab to the intravenous ones. And it would be fantastic if any um, drug company wants to bring that one in. Um, we'd love to have access to that. It would make life cheaper for, um, for, for medical aids and easier for the patients. Okay, what else have we got access to? And so now we're gonna move on to our antibody drug conjugates. And those of us who are lucky to work in private um, will have had access to this drug now and um, for a little while. And, and this of course is the way we all wanna go. It's the magic silver bullet. You have your antibody that seeks out your cell and um, attached to which is a payload of cytotoxic chemotherapy and it releases its payload um, once it reaches its cell and thereby decreasing systemic side effects. So these two trials are um, the confirmatory trials of efficacy in advanced disease, the Teresa trial looking in late stage and the Amelia trial looking in second line treatment. They're both phase three trials um, compa com uh, comparing them to in late stage treatment of investigator's choice and in second line to the current standard of care, which is lapatinib plus capecitabine. And I've just given you the overall survival data because actually that's what your patient wants to know. Am I going to live longer if I take this drug? And there you can see um, in both cases that you actually are going to live longer if you take your antibody drug conjugate compared to lapatinib and capecitabine in the second line or in drug of investigator's choice um, later on. Let's bring it back earlier. And the Catherine trial is, is the one that we know of that, we, that I always put the front page of in when I send my requests off to medical aid for my patients to get adjuvant um, treatment with um, TDM1 if they've got residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And this was a trial designed to look at exactly that. Should you stay on trastuzumab if you haven't got a complete pathological response or would you benefit from something more intense? Um, primary endpoint was invasive, invasive disease-free survival and the usual overall um, um, secondary endpoints. And here you can see a nice separation in the curve in the invasive disease-free survival out at five years. Um, but actually, these patients did very well. And, and um, in terms of distant um, recurrence, there was very little um, um, in both arms. Um, and death without a prior event showing that the stuff was um, safe and was equivalent in the two secondary survival, distant recurrence, you can see there is this, um, a, a, a separation in the curves and it is statistically significant, whereas in overall survival, there's, the curves start to separate, but we haven't got there yet. And so I think it's fair to say in those patients who are at high risk, and this might be something that you can consider and it's a nice to have. 
at what cost? Well, I'm not going to talk about the financial, but in terms of side effects, the more I use this drug, the more I see it does have side effects, even though it's supposed to only deliver its payload to those cells that, that overexpress the receptor. Um, fatigue is a big one. Um, arthralgia is a big one. And in my experience, I've had a number of patients, interestingly, um, have worsening of their peripheral neuropathy or um, getting peripheral neuropathy, whereas they didn't with their Texan before. And when I switch them back to transduzumab, um, their, their neuropathy disappears. It's a real side effect of this treatment. And you can see on this slide the, the grade one, two, and three side effects. And then every single side effect you might wish to have, undoubtedly, um, the antibody drug conjugate comes with more side effects. Well, can we do better yet? If the curves aren't, aren't horizontal. So let's look at um, what it totally excites me, but, but um, and I think it's going to be a while till we get this. Um, this is the next iteration of the antibody drug conjugate. This is trastuzumab deruxtecan. Um, and the big difference between this and TDM1 is that it's got a better chemotherapy payload, basically. It's got a topa, uh, topa isomerase 1 chemo um, attached to it. Um, and um, uh, Xavier Cortez public, uh, presented and published presented this at ESMO last year. Um, fantastic news, the Destiny Breast 3 trial. These were patients who had previously been treated with trastuzumab and ataxan in the metastatic or advanced breast cancer setting. And it was comparing TDM1 to this new drug TDXD. Um, they actually had to, it, the results were so good that they had to stop the clinical trial. Um, it crossed the pre-specified um, border for stopping the clinical trial. And there, I just quickly want to show you how big those, those um, separation of curves is. Um, there was a 1.5 year difference in progression-free survival between TDXD and TDM1. And remember, TDM1 had pretty good results in the first place. So this is really big news. Um, can I go backwards? Um, that's not that interesting. Um, I don't have to go backwards. I'll keep going forwards. Okay, so here we go. Um, this is the same look at the same kind, a different look at the same kind of data. Um, Progression-free survival, overall survival um, data is not mature yet, but you can see an early separation of the curves. Subgroup analysis, this is very exciting for those patients um, who have um, brain metastases, and you can see that they generally do incredibly badly, but they seem to do a hell of a lot better if you give them TDXD. Um, and in fact, not just those with brain metastases, but there's not a single subgroup that doesn't do better with TDXD. And um, if you look on that slide, all of it is well on the left side of that line. So every single one of them did better. This includes patients, by the way, that were treated with prior pertuzumab as well. Safety data, is it safe? Well, I've never used it, um, um, but um, it appears the big side effect of this stuff is like it's, it's so common with many of our targeted treatments is interstitial pneumonitis. But I think those of us who give a lot of these drugs are getting quite, quite good at, at recognizing this early on. And if you get an early, if your patient starts to cough or is short of breath, you know, got a couple of crackles, you need to stop the drug. Um, you need to give them steroids and wait till resolution of the symptoms, and then you can go back on it um, if they recover to um, level one or not. And if you do that, then actually most of them don't land up coming off the drug. And of course, those who can stay on do fantastically well. So, so um, um, side effects of this drug, if you look at the clinical trial, I want to have a look. There we go. Yeah. Um, side effects um, definitely resulted in dose reductions in multiple patients on TDXD versus TDM1. Um, but once you've done that, it still seems to be pretty effective. Um, you have to watch out for um, pancytopenia as opposed to just um, a decrease in platelets like you have to do with TDM1, um, but also cardiomyopathy, um, watch the liver functions, and most patients apparently feel really nauseous. Um, where's R? Ah, there we go. Uh, that's exactly the same thing. I'm just having a look. See, no, I can't find. I've, I've obviously checked the slide that showed um, um, more about the side effects of this drug, um, <laughs> which was naughty of me. But it doesn't really matter because none of us can get it anyway for a while. And happily, um, it means that our colleagues overseas will, will work out pretty quickly what's the best way of managing these. And by the time we get it, it um, makes life a lot easier. They've told us exactly how to manage it. 
Okay, once again, that's another sli slide showing you that all subgroups benefited from it. And here, this, this slide, just show, uh, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time about this because one of our biggest problems are unmet needs are our patients with brain meds, which we know that, you know, with systemic disease, um, with systemic treatment, we often find that our first case of relapse in HER2 positive patients these days is in the brain. So lots of people have been looking at that. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the HER2 climb data, and I know that Heidi has at least got one patient whom she's looking to get um, to catnip in, um, and we'll try and have a look why. And here you can see um, on what, on what um, we're basing this. If you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you see the median overall survival agent um, a, a benefit with these new agents in patients with CNS disease. Um, I'll speak to you a little bit about neratinib. I'm not in love with this drug, um, but it is there, um, and I suppose it's it's an option. Um, and some of the other, you can see the Destiny 03 trial, the overall survival, um, re, uh, mean overall survival hasn't even been reached in this clinical trial for those patients on it. Okay, so in summary, um, it's just a fantastic drug, and I think the minute it arrives on our shores, it's going to replace TDM1 as drug of choice. So, so if you are living in a first world country, you, um, you land up having access to TDXD, you might have ticatinib, um, you might have margituximab, and we'll have a look at that, neratinib as well, all sorts of other things. And then of course, uh, the, that which we do have, and which is now being pushed right out as your last agent of choice, lipatinib plus minus capecid, uh, with capecitabine. So what's ticatinib? It's a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, the benefit of this over lapatinib and neratinib is that it, um, you have to give a hell of a lot more of it to get it to bind to the EGFR. So it's far more selective for HER2 as a, as a, um, as a, a TKI. It's well tolerated, apparently. Um, and the HER2 climb trial looked at ticatinib plus trastuzumab and capecitabine um, versus um, um, trastuzumab and capecitabine in patients who'd previously been treated and who brain meds were allowed in this. And here you can see progression-free survival benefit, um, which, looked, um, which has a nice separation of the curves, and indeed a meaningful and statistically significant overall survival benefit with the addition of uh, ticatinib. Um, if you have a look at this, this slide, you can see those patients with um, brain metastases really benefited significantly, such that the patient, number of patients alive at two years um, with ticatinib was about equal to the number of patients alive at one year without ticatinib. So this is, this is meaningful. Um, and and a, a exploratory subanalysis looked at those patients with active brain meds as opposed to treated or stable brain meds. And here, obviously, this has a direct effect on those brain meds because those patients with active brain meds stood to gain a significant benefit. Um, um, same thing, uh, CNS uh, progression-free metastases in the interest of time. I'm not going to go on too much about this. Safety, well, it actually doesn't look too bad. Um, it, once again, a little bit more in terms of side effects of all the side effects that we know, um, bad diarrhea, um, which is an EGFR-related toxicity we know about. Um, and so you just have to make sure that you watch out for that. So there are many clinical trials of these new agents um, um, undergoing uh, either that they've published yet or um, are um, in process. And there are all sorts of interesting things. Um, I don't know much about um, perognib, um, but this, in fact, has even been licensed based on these, um, um, these data, these published data um, in China, of all things. And once again, you can just see that there's a wealth of, of stuff coming out. What about some other antibodies? Well, there's margituximab, um, which um, by the, if you just look at the end of the name, it reminds you of what it is. That's how I remember. Um, it's, so it's a trastuzumab-like um, antibody, but it is slightly engineered to have re a different relative efficacies for subsets of the receptor. Um, this is the SOFIA trial that was um, presented by Hope Rugo. And, and to be honest, I don't find those data that exciting, but perhaps it too has a place. Um, so it's an it's uh, antibody of interest. And as, the big thing about this stuff is it apparently is really nasty to give. And it has to be infused intravenously, and it can really give nasty uh, infusion reactions. So you have to pre-medicate your patients and watch out for that, unlike trastuzumab, where the majority of our patients don't get infusion reactions. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not going to go on too much about that. Um, um, 
Um, Lapatinib and neratinib, we know, we know well um, lapatinib. Um, neratinib um, is, not, is not licensed here for treatment in South Africa, but if your patient does need it, you can get it on um, compassionate use access. I've given it to a patient before. And the big thing, of course, um, is with, with um, neratinib is the diarrhea. It was looked at in the NALA trial compared to lapatinib, and it was better. It gave you a 2.2 month progression-free survival a benefit. I don't know if it's worth it because if, as you can see here, every single one of your patients, over 90% of patients are going to land up with at least grade one diarrhea and over, over three quarters of them, about three quarters of them are going to land up with grade three diarrhea. This is vicious. Um, so it's a question of whether it's, it's worth it or not. And you, apparently the way to give it is that you, you start slow and titrate up and you don't wait for your patients to get diarrhea. You have to immediately start off with loperamide and other drugs in order to, in order to prevent that. Um, cardio, um, toxicity of, of, of anti HER2 agents. I think most of these we know, and so I'm not going to spend time on this, but the Safe Heart trial was designed to exactly look at that um, and, and um, show you that, um, you know, if you can, most patients actually get through fine, and the majority of, of, side, of cardiac side effects are subclinical in patients. But not to forget that it can happen, especially in those patients who are predisposed to it. So um, if you lived in the first world uh, last year, you would give trastuzumab plus pertuzumab um, in your metastatic, line, um, metastatic treatment, and then you would give TDM1, um, but you might even give tucatinib, um, and third line, you'd give trastuzumab deruxtecan, which we can't give any of this stuff, but um, there it is. That was last year, and already, if, I didn't even show you 2022, because in 2022, trastuzumab deruxtecan is now pushed up TDM1 as second line treatment of choice. <laughs> So why might our patients still be dying of HER2 positive breast cancer? And I think um, it's important for those people who are um, involved in the cutting area of research to look at these mechanisms of resistance and for us to remember them. Um, just touching a little bit on what Noah was talking about, um, do you remember that HER2 positive diseases, you move from the early breast cancer to the advanced breast cancer um, setting, um, there's an increase um, in the expression of HER2 low disease, which comes at the expense of HER2 negative mm -hmm. disease. Those patients who are strongly HER2 positive tend to remain so in the, in the metastatic setting, but now we've got these HER2 low patients who are an unmet clinical need. Um, Apparently, trastuzumab deruxtecan is much better at, at, and has significant uh, efficacy. And I haven't shown you those because they're still mm -hmm. early data, but some trials have shown efficacy in HER2 low. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably where we'll see a lot of data coming out in the future. The last group of patients that I just quickly want to talk about is one that you've noticed, you might have noticed that I've said nothing about. And these are the triple positive patients. Um, and, and actually, they're our largest group of HER2 positive patients. And why have we not seen anything in that? And I think I'm afraid to say the reason that we haven't seen much about that is because it's a hell of a lot easier to get nice separation of your curves in HER2 estrogen receptor negative patients when you only target the, the HER2 receptor. Whereas if you add in an alternative escape pathway, in other words, crosstalk with the, with the hormonal pathway, you get a lot of extra noise. And so your curve separations aren't that great. But these are the majority of our patients and they're very important. So I just wanted to give you a quick word about the Monarch HER trial, um, and, and this was a reminder to me, um, specifically not to forget the value of, of, of treating both those pathways in advanced disease part and advanced disease. So this looked at women who um, had um, um, more than two anti-HER2 directed therapies in the advanced breast cancer setting. So that's quite a lot. These are heavily pretreated patients. And there they were randomized to either trastuzumab and chemotherapy, again, you know, third line choice, um, or alternatively, a bimacyclib, your CDK46 inhibitor, plus trastuzumab, plus trastuzumab, leaving off your cytotoxic, but not, not, not adding in an anti-ER, and then a combination of three, a bimacyclib, trastuzumab, and fulvestrant. These patients must not have had fulvestrant previously. Um, and the usual gamut of primary and secondary endpoints are looked at. And here you can see that actually there is a statistically significant benefit for these heavily pretreated patients in giving them trastuzumab, fulvestrant, and abimacyclib. And this 
is actually even better than giving them third line chemotherapy plus trastuzumab. So I think this is something that we need to bear in mind and perhaps I, it's a wake up call to me to use it more, um, published by Sandra Tulaney in the Lancet Oncology last year. Okay, there are more ongoing that have either been published or um, in process at the moment. And I look forward to that. And it's a call to all, all drug companies out here to please not to forget this very important subgroup of patients um, who are with us um, to the very bitter end. And that's it. And I think I've gotten in time. <laughs> I've well, never spoken so fast in my life. <laughs> uh, Irene, I must tell you that my admiration for you has greatly increased. Uh, in between uh, caring for four kids to prepare a talk like this, I mean, that is quite a performance. Thank you. <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> earlier, but now that I've given it. <laughs> okay, are there any questions from the audience? Nobody's got anything to say. Well, oh, that was... thank you. I was going to say thank you. I'll yeah, see you all yeah. later. <laughs> yes, I, I think I mean, uh, it was a fantastic overview. I think mm -hmm. I, mean, I think this is one of those little gems that one can certainly keep the recording of. Um, so, and I think my question to you really is: I mean, we've we we there's been a lot of progress in terms of new drugs, new ways of doing it, but we're still using a test of 1985. To determine which patients gets what. Yeah. And we're using the test of 1910 to determine which gets second line, which is when your cancer gets worse, will change you mm. to something else. Mm. And yet, and so all the all the you know, the, the, the way of dealing with more expensive treatments is to try and select your patients better. Mm. Um, using things like, you know, I'm just looking at data for, you know, if you look at um, using molecular profiling, if you have a luminal A tumor mm -hmm. molecularly determined, your, your response rate is going to be under 2% mm -hmm. for tertuzumab chemotherapy. Versus if you have a to enrich subtype, it's mm -hmm. going to be almost 70%. <laughs> so it makes a huge difference. And yet, for some reason, it seems to be a, there seems to be a, uh, a barrier to actually introducing that. We're seeing the same with melanoma. Mm -hmm. um, the data on sort of selecting patients that are going to do really bad on a molecular basis is really strong, but no one wants to introduce that because I don't know why. So, I mean, that is, especially, especially for the ERPR positive patients. I mean, I had a quick look. Uh, we have about 220 patients. No, I'm talking not. So we have about, um, out of 220 patients, there were about 80 patients that were HER2 positive. Mm. Uh, ER, PR, HER2 positive. Out of those, one patient is a basal subtype. Mm -hmm. Seven patients are HER2 enriched, and the rest are all luminal patients. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that is a huge deal um, in terms of making a decision about, you know, keeping someone on treatment for a year. I think that question should be directed actually at Noah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I don't even think that's a question. I think that's a statement of fact. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it's really sad. I, I think probably because, you know, it's not good. <laughs> and and I'm hate to have a, I hate to have a jaundiced view about this kind of thing, but I think part of the problem is that, in a sense, um, many drug companies feel that they've established a group of patients who are going to benefit from these, treat these trials. And to go back now and to further subdivide and look is not going to make them any more money. You know, they've already got their product in the market. We've, you know, we've established statistically significant um, benefit patient populations. And to do it all over again at huge cost um, is a problem. And this is where I think that um, they, they, it would be fantastic if first world countries had funds to do these kind of trials, because you do need prospective data. It would be wonderful to do this on a prospective level. And you would save so many people toxicity, but saving toxicity and cost is not, not foremost in funders' minds, I'm afraid. And it requires, yeah. it requires um, philanthropic um, financial um, backing. Before we come uh, to you, Rika, uh, I see Noah is shrinking here. Uh, and, uh, but, but Am I trying to get out of the hot seat? No, 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 no. You all stay in your hot seats, respectively. But I think uh, what we're looking at is here a, uh, a conflict between two terms, the geneticists and the pathologists. And how do you see that? How far is molecular genetic profiling uh, intruding into your job? Well, specifically for her too, I mean, the only known test is those basic tests that you 
and those are the only clinically validated tests. And I believe that we should probably have better tests and that molecular tests will become more important. But at the moment, that is still very limited access we have as a well, in, rea in the reality is the pathologist will only do the test which will be something you can utilize to treat the patient according to you know in fact the pathologist has no choice in the matter the pathologist does just does what the ASCO guideline says in terms of how do you make the diagnosis so the problem comes from the clinician side or the people that's drawing up the guideline side to say we want to stick with this 1985 technology looking at one single gene on the surface of a cell to make a determination of whether this drives the cell's proliferation. Mm. I just want to remind you the microscope was invented in 1630. So <laughs> not well, the the chemist. Um, you know, <laughs> people I, I fail to understand how we haven't got something better than a than a stethoscope for cardiac disease. I mean why I'm about this? Yeah, no. Can I ask you, 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 uh, uh, Pafke gave us the Oncomine. Yes. Uh, so why not having something similar to the target print to get the molecular subtype sorted out? What is the obstacle? Yeah, that's a difficult question. I'm not. I think too sure. Sure. I think a large part of that is yeah. inertia. Yeah. You know, we are uh, as clinicians. We also have the same uh, thing before. A uh, method is accepted in clinical practice. It takes at least 20 years after the initial uh, research finding. But change will come and it will do you good. It's, it's also depending on what tests are validated in clinical practice. So we go according to that. So many of these other tests are all in the research phase. So it's, it's difficult to establish in clinical practice. 